Okay, very good morning. It is the 1st of April, so welcome to a new month, a new quarter. And just a reminder, we have the Amplify Market Watch uh, podcast. It's going to go out on Friday as per normal. Uh, Piers and I will record that, so despite the kind of market closure, public holiday, we'll do our best to get that out to you uh, tomorrow morning. So don't forget to just um, search and subscribe for Market Watch by Amplify Live on Spotify, Apple, um, Google, and so on and so forth. So do check that out if you haven't already done so. Otherwise, let's get straight into it and start talking about what's going on in markets this morning. And I guess we've got to start chronologically with the close on Wall Street before we then review the market sentiment here at the European Open. And so just a quick look at the S&P 500 heat map. And as you can see, uh, mega cap tech names outperforming the dominant squares here, the largest market cap names uh, firmly into the green, saw the NASDAQ outperform. NASDAQ 100 up around 1.5%, the Dow actually negative a quarter, the S&P up about a third of 1%. Um, so one of the ones I just wanted to, to comment on briefly here was Microsoft. Um, wasn't the star performer, uh, our performance likes of Tesla up about 5%. Um, in like Facebook, we're up around two and a quarter, but Microsoft did see uh, catch a late bid. So I just wanted to comment on what's a pretty cool picture, really, and uh, and obviously a big deal for Microsoft because it came out last night that they have signed a deal with the U.S. Army for augmented reality headsets uh, based on its Halo lens, as you can see here, products and backed by the Azure Cloud Computing Services. The contract could be up to nearly $22 billion over a 10-year period. Uh, and what this headset allows them, the Army, to do is help train soldiers, essentially. Um, it helps them hone in on targets and be aware of nearby threats by overlaying contextual information on the real world in an augmented uh, reality. So, yeah, um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, just so I'd, I'd mention that. Uh, and, and yeah, late late lift in MSFT shares at the end of the session. In terms of the overnight session, um, the Asia session kind of followed on from the general positive handover from from, from the US. And we also had Biden's speech, of course, uh, and he came out and unveiled he is going to put two trillion dollars in government spending into infrastructure, alongside though two trillion dollars in higher corporate taxes. Um, on that point. Uh, Biden wants to raise corporate tax from 21 to 28%, so meaningful jump higher, but a figure of 28 that we have heard before, so not massively surprising. Um, that And he wants to muster the additional revenue through a 21% global minimum tax calculated by a country-by-country -country basis. So it hits profits in, in tax havens is what the White House are trying to um, obtain. So... On the FT article, you know, for those interested, it kind of breaks it down. The spending, obviously, this is this is the first part of two. This one more focused on kind of domestic infrastructure, so transportation infrastructure, um, manufacturing subsidies, so on and so forth. How are they going to spend and how they're going to generate the revenue? And, and, and one of those revenues, the biggest one, of course, corporate tax increases. But also in there um, is some other things like end of fossil fuel tax breaks and anti-inversion measures, for example. So it could be quite interesting on the, the sector reactions to some of these. Um, overall, though, I'd say generally uh, nothing too shocking here, but it's quite a meaty speech with lots of little nuances to it. Um, so probably need a bit of time to, to chew it over in terms of the details. But but markets for the for the open this morning from a sentiment perspective obviously have, have quite liked what they've heard. Um, we remain up at around the higher levels in equity indices. I was just looking at the DAX a moment ago before I came on and I mean look at the DAX for the week. Just just pretty much one way traffic that we've been trading uh, since the twenty fifth. So super impressive there, having having broken through 15,000, of course, in the DAX future. Uh, the NASDAQ technically coming back to an interesting area of the kind of triple top um, that we saw on 22nd through to the 24th of the month of March. Uh, retest that was seen right around the close yesterday in US trade failed to break, but we're right back up there in close proximity of it again for the NASDAQ. Uh, and the S&P likewise seemingly 
on its on its way to the four thousands. It feels a bit inevitable uh, at this point in time. Uh, other assets, gold obviously saw really nice bounce, just pulling off uh, some of the pressure that it was seeing uh, of late, and so we've managed to recover up to a point of just finding some near-term resistance here. Um, you can see on the third test at around 17, 15 and a half here in the futures uh, after a nice about turn with some of the pullback in the dollar that we saw yesterday. But one thing with that, the dollar is um, in a bit of a recovery mode at the moment in terms of the Asia PAC session, trades up the Dixie about one tenth this morning. So both major pairs seem a touch lower. Um, one currency pair I did want to mention was the Aussie dollar. Uh, you will remember I was talking about the Aussie dollar on the Amplify live feed um, last week, and it was a video we shared with our YouTube community. Uh, but the Aussie is just breaking down a little bit uh, in the overnight session, and on the daily chart, technically, uh, we've had quite a, quite a significant break of of that low that we were seeing uh, back in late February. Uh, and the breakdown of that price has just led to a bit of an extension with some of the, the recovery from yesterday's losses in the dollar uh, in the Dixie. So um, continues to trade firmly below now um, the 100 DMA line, which is the blue line, uh, and does open up technically room for a bit of downside here. Uh, and just to recap, we were looking at the Kiwi dollar as the litmus test on the break of the 100 DMA with the same structure to the Feb uh, and kind of March lows and when that broke it traded very heavy quite quickly uh, interestingly now the Aussie uh, the Kiwi excuse me has found uh, on the pullback from that initial flush lower we saw at the end of March some resistance around the 70 psychological handle which was the floor to price in the period of consolidation through November December and we're just knocking on the door again of that low that we had on the 25th of March um, so any any further dollar strength be looking for a continuation uh, and maybe a bit of further momentum on the break through that technical low and that would certainly help then um, further downside in sympathy with that move then um, with the Aussie. With the Aussie uh, probably looking down you've got the 75 psychological then 74, 71 was the low that we had on the 21st of deck and then lower down more aggressive target of 7405 would be the high that we had from late August um, of last year and, and then early part of December. So, so worth keeping an eye on that as that starts to play out now uh, with some Aussie prevailing weakness and some nice technicals being taken out. Um, oil prices, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about OPEC in a, in a moment. Um, pretty quiet, really. We had a bit of a breakdown in price seen uh, late yesterday. Uh, found a bit of a flaw at the moment around the $59 handle. So really just awaiting now uh, what the latest outcome is and confirmation of the rollover of the supply pack that's expected for May from OPEC Plus today. A um, couple of other points then from the news. Uh, overnight, we did have the latest Keqin market manufacturing PMI from China. Um, so this is the Keqin reading. So rather than the state reading we had earlier in the week, which is looking at more state-led and larger corporations, this is more smaller firms. And it dropped to 50 spot six last month, the lowest reading actually since April of 2020, and below expectations of 51.3. Not really a great deal of reaction to that local indices generally trading with a more positive tone just following the overall macro kind of trend at the moment. The other thing you might have read about is that France uh, are heading into a month long lockdown. It was announced by um, President Macron last night. They're going to close schools and businesses starting from Saturday. Uh, Italy has joined Germany as well, extending their partial shutdowns well into April, with Draghi um, saying that current restrictions and movement on business openings in high-risk areas will remain in place until the end of April. Um, I was just having a look at, you know, there's a really fantastic website for tracking all things COVID, uh, which I'm sure most of you will already be using, but if you're not, it's called Our World in Data. And there is something that they've compiled called a stringency, stringency index. Uh, and what that basically is, is um, a composite measure based on nine response indicators, including things like school closures, workplace closures, travel bans, so on and so forth. And from that, it can be rescaled to a value of between zero and 100. 100 being the most strict restrictions uh, and the most loose being zero. <coughs> 
And this is just kind of focusing in the map on, on Europe. And as you can see here, um, this is gonna obviously become more deeper blue for France as they step up now to a more aggressive uh, restrictions in place for a month. But you can see Italy uh, on the index at 84.26, one of the highest actually in the Eurozone. Greece at 87.96, the UK at 70, 76. Uh, so interestingly, overlaying kind of COVID case rates, we've obviously been seeing that re-emerge in the likes of France, Italy, and other places in mainland Europe and Germany. However, the UK has had a relative, by comparison, high level of, of stringency index ranking, if you like, compared to its European peers. Um, irrespective of the fact that COVID cases have remained fairly low in comparative terms. So just goes to show the, the quite stark difference there in strategy um, at the moment. But obviously the UK has to face a slightly different challenge now with the um, restrictions on some of the Astra drugs, given that consignment in India and what's happening as well going on with the EU. And on that point, the EU are remaining pretty firm at the moment of their stance. A senior Brussels policymaker last night basically sought to quash any British hopes of attaining AstraZeneca vaccines manufactured in mainland Europe, uh, saying zero jabs will be shipped across the channel if the company failed to meet its commitments in the block. I um, had a really good chat with Mike in our Amplify Live community uh, in a session we recorded yesterday. And, you know, quite, quite key then at the moment, AstraZeneca... Um, are, well, the UK are, are pretty much going to put new first jabs on halt for the month of April as they look to use their Pfizer supply in order to enact then the second round of shots for those who've already received their first dose given that they'll be hitting that 12 month or 12 week kind of marker. Uh, and at the moment, what we're on the lookout for is the Indian manufacturing firm Serum and whether the UK government, I guess, in some shape or form can break some, break some kind of deal with them in order to then release then further consignments of that 5 million or so extra vaccines that have been pent up. Um, very much so that the EU unlikely to really play too many games around the Pfizer by Entech drug, uh, even though it's manufactured to or in Europe and exported to the UK. The point is, is that certain ingredients in that process are derived from the UK, uh, namely in Yorkshire. And so they would not want any retaliatory effect on what ultimately is Europe's key drug, which is that Pfizer BioNTech one. Uh, so yeah, something to just be aware of. The other drug news um, came out in the New York Times actually just a few hours ago and it's about Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, which really is still to hit the market, um, but they have reportedly hit a delay due to a factory mix-up, which has ruined apparently around 15 million doses. So worth being aware of that for, for the US in particular, where a lot of their focus um, is going to be in terms of deployment of the early phase of manufacturing for J&J's vaccine. Um, they have said they're still on, on target, shouldn't impede that. It was just one batch that's been affected um, because of a, a manufacturing issue that was experienced at the time. Okay, looking at the day ahead, <coughs> what have we got? So just skipping over the Asia session with that now concluded. Moving over to the European morning, you do get the manufacturing uh, PMI numbers for the Eurozone and the UK, but these are March final readings, not expecting too much there. Going into the afternoon, the build-up for non-farms tomorrow, despite Good Friday closures, continues, so we get weekly jobless claims. Um, we are expecting jobless claims to come in at 680 against 684, and so what does jobless claims look like? Well, you'll remember down here on the far right-hand side, last week we printed at 6. Um, 684, in fact, for jobless claims. It was the lowest level since the pandemic hit the labour market in March 2020 last week. And we are actually looking for further gradual improvement uh, in the job situation. So therefore, net a slightly lower jobless figure today. Um, in the short term, claims are expected to continue to decrease. Uh, the kind of passage and of the relief stimulus uh, from, from the Biden government in early March and several states easing their coronavirus-induced restrictions should lead to, um, in combination with rapid pace of vaccinations, further people going into employment, 
I guess the thing we're yet to determine is, is that impeded at all by the slight uptick we've had in the last fortnight of US COVID cases and the recommendation for the president in order to be a little bit more cautious about the speed of that reopening process. But at the moment, the jobless should continue to paint a relatively good picture. Um, if we get a 680 type reading, which was kind of the forecast estimate, I don't think necessarily it's particularly market moving. If anything, I'd probably see it as mildly positive in the sense that that pattern of improvement continues. The Fed obviously aren't doing anything at the moment, and that might help just generally support that overall growth kind of narrative at the moment that's that's helping just general market sentiment of um, yields still remaining relatively high, but not now impeding the equity performance, which is more focusing on the growth story, um, more generally speaking. Um, the other data point that we have this afternoon from the US of, of significance is um, the ISM US ISM manufacturing PMI and I just wanted to bring this up this is like a looking back over the last 25 years or so for for this particular reading because today the S expected value is for 61.3 um, so an improvement from the prior reading and if that did happen uh, that would put us at a multi-decade high for this reading up here kind of around 2004 um, last month's reading saw the strongest expansion in factory activity in the US since February of 2018. So you can see here the rapid recovery that we've had since the trough that we hit shortly after the national lockdown experienced uh, almost 12 months ago in the US. And, and, and so again, a supportive factor for, for markets, I think, intraday, short term on a, on a strong number. Uh, and again, the dollar could be interesting particularly in the context then of just generally lower levels in the euro. Uh, we're not too far from where we were trading uh, back on Tuesday's low was in, is in proximity and also the likes of that Aussie trade that we were just talking about a short while ago would be supported uh, by strong data if we get further movement higher in dollar and yields uh, in that respect. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it other than to conclude the OPEC meeting. Um, looking out for any you know rumors things like that um, a couple of the latest that I've seen this morning um, was the JMMC has recommended the extension of compensation cuts until the end of September 2021 according to sources so overall the general theme here is we're not looking for any surprises but we could have said that last time and they did surprise by by rolling over when we were expecting a moderate increase to supply this time it's the other way around. So could they increase supply? They could. Will they do that? Highly unlikely. If they did do that, it would be sure thing and negative for price in the intraday environment. Um, so really looking for confirmation, if anything, that they're just rolling over for the month of May, including the, involu uh, the voluntary cuts from Saudi Arabia as well. Um, they might give um, a minor gesture to the Russians to increase again marginally with Kazakhstan. Uh, I wouldn't read really too much into that. Those levels uh, are fairly insignificant uh, to that degree comparative to the actual supply across OPEC+. Plus. So, yeah, could well be supportive of price, I guess, on the confirmation, maybe perhaps a little bit of relief. But also, if we get strong data, low jobless, high ISM, that might help as well to kind of growth view and subsequently lift oil on the demand uh, kind of side of things in the short term kind of sentiment basis. Uh, but that's it so again don't forget to check out uh, the podcast uh, literally just just jump on spotify hit the follow button and then it will just update automatically when we we launch the uh, or release the next episode on friday morning cool all right i will see the guys in the amplify live community in the in the discord room otherwise for everyone else on youtube hit that like button and subscribe to the channel very much appreciate it have a fantastic long weekend uh, for Easter. Take care and I'll catch you later. Thanks very much.